I prepared my, my, my lecture in English. Um, do you want me to speak in English? Other, do you mind? Well, there was some kind of an uncertainty about the, about the, the language, but I'm, I'm glad to, to, say, to give it in, in, in English. Um, yes. Um, Um, the Professor Dean Tufel Tichman men mentioned um, several names you can see on, on, on this slide. Um, and one of the peculiarities of, of social sciences and, and maybe sciences in general, especially in this part of the world, that ideas um, are surfacing much earlier than, than they are recognized. And so I understand really praising myself and praising these wonderful people from whom I have learned a lot um, and, and most of them I knew and still know personally and working together not all of them are with us um, like Sigmund Bauman, Paz and um, Eleni Honkish and Benjamin Barber but mentioning Eleni Honkish about 15 years ago when we were colleagues in the Institute of uh, Political Science at the Hungarian Academy of Sciences, 12 years ago, he brought up a suggestion that we should name, rename um, our age. Um, and his claim was that we live in a new age of uncertainty. Nobody was interested in it. There was almost no reaction. Um, and people said, well, each time in history is uncertain, so what is, what is, it's not a big deal. And we had, we started to have uh, organized meetings, seminars, more and more people were involved. Um, I, I was giving lectures in many places, um, a course in, in New York, Columbia University. There was very little response. Not because people are more stupid than Hungarian social scientists in, in New York or in or in Berlin, or, but because I think we live, this is part of our, the part of the problem, part of our, our crisis, in, in, um, in a time there where we are somehow obliged to be short-sighted. So very, very little long-term vision. Um, and this is, this is characteristic of our Western world, both in business, immediate profit, profit maximization, mm -hmm. <clears throat> uh, in the name of, of free market, pushing out all the competitors and creating monopolies, but immediately we need the profit now. In politics, four years. Yeah. Some politicians do have visions, but they forget immediately after they are elected, they concentrate on today and tomorrow and to get re-elected. And unfortunately, social sciences does not have strong roots in Eastern Central Europe in terms of institutionalization. They have great graves, but almost all of them became very known abroad. Don't go into details. It's very difficult, almost impossible, according to some of my colleagues, to make a real professional academic career if you are a social scientist, even an economist, in Hungary. Well, this can be a good topic to discuss. So, we started to talk about uncertainty. There were more um, um, positive um, colleagues like Benjamin Barber, the famous guru of, of civil society, strong civil society and democracy from New York. Uh, he started a movement, actually, intellectual movement, <coughs> which I was part of, called Interdependence Movement, and his um, organization was Word, the Civic Word. He was a frequent uh, lecturer and visitor here in, in, in Gersen, in our um, and in the Budapest conferences. The, who, Emmanuel Wollaston, probably the, the closest to me, I have been uh, interviewing him for 30 years um, about his changing views of the bird system. Um, there's no time to go into details, but um, a few, a few sentences about the world system approach and world system theory, <clears throat> which was also kind of sidelined 
I would say, neglected, even the Western world, because it was a radical view, a radical conceptualization of a changing world. <clears throat> and was not part of the mainstream, this, the um, academic um, um, uh, world. His main argument is that the modern world system is a historic product which was born around 15th, 16th century. It has a trajectory, and by the 20th century, middle of the 20th century, it reached um, <coughs> a certain saturation. It cannot really <coughs> grow further. And as a system, it is going to bifurcate. It's going to pursue a transformation um, at the end of which we don't know what's going to be, um, what's going to happen. And uh, the, in other words, the system lost its capability to recreate equilibrium. If a system is unable, it's, it's, it's not just social science, it's a general theory, it's a system, it's cause complexity is growing, and after a while it's not able to reach an equilibrium, the system will bifurcate, explode, collapse, <coughs> or <coughs> become something different, something else. In particular, the seventh year, the eighth is, and first, uh, he was criticized because his theory was a little determinist, a little mechanistic, so to say. <coughs> he did learn from, from the criticism, and the latest um, interview I made with him was 2010. He came to the conclusion that we are now living in a time of relatively relatively free will. What did he mean? He said that if the system is determined, all the players' game, role, um, is determined. You can't really change much. But if the system is losing uh, this determination, um, relatively unknown, small, marginalized, sidelined players might have a big impact an absolute big impact, but at least a chance to change certain things. And that I applied, yes, we did not agree with it, about something, you know, <coughs> to our case. Because according to his theory, and that's not just Polish, right, is that we are here in Eastern Central Europe, what we can call a semi-periphery between a more underdeveloped East, was true. Um, 50, 100 years ago, more than today, and, and the center of the world economy, which was first Western Europe and then United States and Western Europe, and today is even bigger. But the theory says that semi peripheries, like let's say Hungary, Slovakia, Poland, and other countries, do have a chance, theoretically and practically, to move up to the center. <clears throat> He denied that this is going to happen in the case. Now, Hungary the always told me for 30 years that Hungary is not that much. So I don't want Hungary to become that much, but still we have a chance probably to change. Now, what is uh, very important from our point of view that he was completely right in, 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 in terms of this equilibrium. And I'm observing it, observing it, and I came to the conclusion that this is an irreversible process. <clears throat> the word system, the capitalist world economy and its, its uh, superstructure, the political institutions, cannot become the same as they were 50 or 100 years ago. <clears throat> In other words, business as usual is not going to come back. And this is bad news for a lot of people who are in profit making, in big industry, and multinational companies. <clears throat> I remember discussions a couple of years ago, we started the research together with Sitchin University, about uh, the region here, which is called um, uh, Insula Magna, City of Fresh Child Workers. And when I brought up my assumptions, it was, there was no sympathy with that, Su suggestions. Um, they did not react too harshly against it, but they thought, they believed that this is a short crisis, yeah, maybe it's deeper than you, but business as usual can come back in and continue to build um, highways. Uh, more and more car industry, more hotels, um, batoning down um, uh, seashores or, or lake shores, etc., etc. Um, today, I'm sure they, they change their opinion. Not, maybe not all of them. So 
<coughs> the disequilibrium and the relatively free will <coughs> is again characteristics of this new age, which is not just uncertain, but it's changing rapidly. Um, most of these this system theoreticians, Erwin Laszlo, who's a member of um, the Club of Rome and then he created the Budapest Club, he also came to the same conclusion that with this consciousness, the, the human being is possess possessing today, we cannot manage uh, to control these changes. So his ba basic argument was that we need a planetary consciousness. Uh, <clears throat> it's a good question of debate. Dan Brooks is a frequent visitor in Kursak, <clears throat> a very well-known evolutionary biologist from the United States. Um, he started to become very inter- and multidisciplinary in his lectures in Kursak, and, and he predicted five, six years ago uh, the pandemics, and that more and more pandemia is going to come, and that we need to prepare for that. And unfortunately, uh, our institute's obligation to report um, local governments and national government, even, even EU regional governments, we did not get much response. So there is here, I'm going to come back to you at the end of my lecture on this. There is no functioning communication line in an efficient way between sciences, researchers, natural, <clears throat> technical, and social sciences, and governance in general. And that is a crucial point, so that I will add to Professor Friedler's um, introductory remarks that we not only need to be more visible hmm, on European level or global level as a university or as an academic institution, we have to be able <coughs> to inform decision making, decision preparation, decision making in a very responsible way. And now what I'm saying was not seen as part of the roles <coughs> or tasks of the academic community. For many years, and you are too young, but the older generation remembers. But it was a general belief that oh, we are looking at yes, researchers. We are looking for truths. Yeah? And it's up to the politicians what they do with our research results. This is completely changed. It has to change. Otherwise, we, we will be perished. So, okay. Um, Thomas Sandesh, my professor, <coughs> is, uh, Elamir Honkish was in a way my mentor. I've been working together with Thomas Sentes for 45 years. It's going to be 90 soon. And um, a couple of days, weeks ago, he called me that he summarized his personal views about this very complex situation. And so I wrote a paper in Hungarian in English, he translated, <coughs> being Messina. This is the, the final thread, the ultimate burial. It, it's, it's a very bold piece, and, and, and I recommend you to, to read it, because um, it combines the personal moral view with, um, with the deepest um, um, uh, academic conclusions of a very rich um, uh, academic life. And here is his most important message. He, we, in social sciences and in sciences general, we have to understand the problems of fragmentation. If knowledge remains fragmented, if you cannot build bridges, it's not, it's multi inter transdisciplinarity, it's a very complicated uh, issue. I don't want to go into it. Then we are going to continue to the, the deepening of the global crisis. The problem, the basic problem is, is the rejection of interdependence, the rejection of the fact that in this more and more globalized world, we are very seriously and dangerously interlinked. Either it doesn't matter if we like it or not. And so if, if, if uh, sciences will be compartmentalized the same day, we have the departments, we have the journals, and sociology, and political science, and physics, <coughs> we cannot give um, adequate answers to the complexities of our world. And there's a debate about it for decades, but the mainstream um, academic life in Hungary and also abroad in the Western world um, somehow resisting this idea. There are, of course, good 
well-known scientists who are on, on the opposite side, there are journals, articles, etc. UNESCO, even the UN, is pushing um, the, the interconnectedness of social sciences and the responsibility of researchers, but I would say there is no serious breakthrough yet. This is a power question. The power, the political power and the academic power is very similarly organized. Yeah? We have disciplines, the German word, discipline, punishment. Yeah? <laughs> No philosophy, please. Uh, we have uh, nation states with, with their boundaries, which, which very falsely identify with societies. Of course, you can define the boundary of the government, the state, the shoe, okay? but um, the boundaries of the state are not the boundaries of societies. And that is the source of contradictions and and the complexities of things you cannot deal with. We don't have tools. So I completely agree with Thomas Sanders that one of the deepest crises is our, the crisis of our democracy, as democracy uh, is seen, <clears throat> or as we knew it, as we know it, yeah? the post-Second <coughs> World War American type of liberal um, representative democracy. It's not that we need less democracy, but that we need more democracy, I think, um, but more sophisticated and, and, and multilateral democracy. And here I jump a bit, the big jump, to my, my favorite um, topic, the European integration, the European Union, which was, for me personally, for decades, um, a very promising enterprise in terms of creating new institutions for further transnational institutions and democratization. And um, as we will see, as we see, it, it's not, it was not really successful up until today. But maybe this crisis is going to open our, not just our IC in Hungary and the Seychelles University and other universities and the academia, but probably in a broader sense. Yes, um, Jody Jensen, who is a senior fellow uh, of our institute in Kursek, speaks about chaotic times. It's a very interesting notion. She introduced this almost 10 years ago. A chaotic is a combination of chaotic and, and, and order type. So when chaos and order is together. Now here the message is, I think, very, very important for us. We have to understand that we not only live in the times of a new time of uncertainty, but the time of paradoxes. So there are, that in many cases, there are no clear and, and, and unambiguous answers to questions in ambiguity and, and uncertainty are together um, combined in a very um, threatening way sometimes with, um, with the lack of our capabilities to give answers. Either there are no answers, or there are many answers. As in mathematical equations, there are equations without a solution. And there are equations with two or more solutions. Infinite. What we know, sorry? What? Infinite numbers. Infinite numbers. <laughs> and, and we are, our way of thinking is very reduced in our, in our Western world. It's a like reductionist way of thinking. They're looking for a linear way of development and one solution. Black or white? We decide. Yeah. But if you cannot, and that's what our other colleague, <coughs> Professor Karakesh, um, uh, put his finger on, there are wicked problems in, coming in, in economics, in ecology, <coughs> in politics, everywhere, which you should be solve. So what do you do when you are a politician, a decision maker? Um, <clears throat> what do you do? You have to move further. So sometimes without a solution and playing with uncertainties. We call it uh, one of our summer universities, um, so the 27 summer universities behind us. Um, the entanglement, the entanglement of, of Central Europe. We are entangled, uh, and, but still we have to dance. 
And that, that, that actually requires a much, a much more complicated kind of knowledge and way of seeing adapting what we call knowledge. Okay, so um, I guess, I, I mean, I'm sure everyone knows the name of Sigmund Bauman. He was the first one who said, to, I don't know, 20, 30 years ago, that this is a liquid reality and we are in, in a grey in the regnum, that the old rules are not adaptable, not working anymore, but there are no new rules. So that's the... <clears throat> yes. Um, jumping soon to the war. Um, but first, just remember, oh, most of you cannot remember, uh, good for you, or not so good for you, that in the late 80s, the second half of the 80s, in 89 to 91, the whole world, but the Western world and Eastern Europe for sure, was um, um, very, very pleased to recognize that uh, the Cold War is over, the nuclear arms race is over, and we are going to live um, peacefully together, East and West. The Soviet troops will be drawn from Eastern Europe in 91, June 19, I think. And um, uh, President Gorbachev offered a unilateral um, uh, disarmament of nuclear weapons, some of the nuclear weapons. Uh, in the hope that uh, the Western world, whom he believed uh, will be partners of a new democratizing <coughs> Soviet Union, <coughs> is going to keep its promise about cooperation. His, his famous slogan was that at the end we are in a common European home. We need to cooperate, we, we need to build Europe <coughs> together. Uh, together demand then still the still existing Soviet Union. Um, and that was 91, um, when he had to step down. Um, still after he stepped down, there was um, a, a leader, the leader of Russia, because the Soviet Union collapsed, um, Yeltsin, who believed that he is going to push the, the case, the cause of democracy further. And uh, by the end of the 90s, and um, I will come back to this, Gorbachev stepping down um, is a famous um, sentence, let me read it for you. Europeans can meet the challenges of the next century only by pooling their efforts. They need one Europe, peaceful and democratic. A prospering Europe that extends a hand to the rest of the world. We see our future in this Europe. And this was said July 1989. Only 33 years ago. And um, this is when two minutes before he was forced to step down. Um, ten years later, um, NATO was already bombing um, for some understandable reasons, but bombing <laughs> Serbia. And here is this famous. Um, sentence from Manfred Werner, <coughs> NATO General Secretary, um, from 1990. The very fact that we are ready not to deploy NATO troops beyond the territory of the Federal Republic of Germany gives the Soviet Union firm security guarantees. That was said by the head of NATO. Um, and. Um, Gorbachev was accused by his followers and by, at, at almost 60-70% um, of the Russian society to be a bit there because he gave up the power of Soviet Union and um, he was cheated by his Western colleagues. Still, in 1999, Yeltsin believed that he gave over power to Putin. He was um, his candidate. It's a Soviet tradition <clears throat> to pick the follower that I have fulfilled my life's mission. Russia will never go back to the past. That was 99, only 20 to 23 years ago. I don't read this very interesting um, self um, evaluations. Um, <clears throat> yes, it also picked Nemtsov, who was an idealist, um, <clears throat> countryside politician 
who believe that he has to clean Kremlin from this international influence of international capital, and we have to, we, um, he believed that we have to nationalize, so he brought in all these guys who are called today the oligarchs. And um, he was killed um, 15 years later, as was um, um, Anna Politkovskaya, a very tough uh, fact-finding journalist. So in the 2000, since 2003, 2004, a completely different life, um, political life was introduced in Russia. Um, and the majority of society, there was a lot of opinion polls, believed um, that um, Stalin was a good leader, Stalinism became popular in, in Russia again, um, and Putin started to um, annihilate um, civil society step by step. Um, all those who had a voice and power, like um, Khodorkovsky, was sent to prison. He was the richest man then, probably of the world, um, the president of Lukoil, now he lives in, 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 in London and the United States, and a very firm opponent of President Putin. And um, uh, Kasparov, the famous chess player, started to organize still the civil society um, in, 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 in Moscow and Russia, um, famous um, marches, and it went for a couple of years, but, um, but that, that was over soon. Um, <coughs> the, yes, in 2005, Russia faced an unprecedented economic boom because of two genius people, um, the finance minister and the head of the central bank. They could um, <coughs> capitalize on, on oil um, the monopoly and made the ruble very strong and um, a remilitarization of Russia started. Putin found a um, new ideology. Uh, following, in the first two years, he was following the line of, of uh, Yeltsin up to a certain degree and believed uh, in the rule of law. And somehow he understood the sun. We are a different society. And he was looking for ideological, philosophical uh, background that he found, um, sorry to say, fascist um, ideologies proto-fascist um, writers um, like, um, like Lugin um, and Ivan Ilin, who, who believed that um, Russia has to find its own rules um, and carve its way uh, towards um, domination um, and uh, the reason of politics. Um, the essence of politics is nothing but identify the enemy and uh, and neutralize it. And so, what is behind this? Sudden change, frustration, uh, <clears throat> um, humiliation, um, and the lack of capability of uh, a thoroughgoing, deeply going dialogue between two different worlds. It has a different path, a different trajectory. Yes, they are different, yes. In many ways, we in the Western world do not agree with a lot of things. But the other part of the coin, and this is one of my, 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 my suggestion or my message, that we have to live with the fact the world is not homogenous. And the idea that, uh, <coughs> that, that Westernization can go further and, and the Western universalistic thinking is going to solve the entire problem of the entire globe is just wrong. And that was not yet recognized, unfortunately. So it was a very, um, how to say, unvisible change, because in, for, for many years, um, Putin was still participating in NATO meetings, and he did give signals in 2005, 6, 7, 8, um, about his um, his um, being annoyed um, uh, that NATO is, is, is pushing further to the east. Um, there was a famous NATO summit in Bucharest um, when he described Ukraine as an artificial country. 2008, yeah? Uh, and questioned Ukraine's right to control uh, its Russian-speaking eastern and southern regions. <clears throat> but even earlier, and that was, I think, a turning point, 2005, um, State of the Nation of the Moscow, 
the collapse of the Soviet Union was the biggest geopolitical catastrophe of the country. Tens of millions of citizens and countrymen found themselves outside Russian territory. And then two years later, in the München famous International Security Conference, the process of NATO enlargement has nothing to do with the modernization of the alliance itself or with raising the level of security in Europe. Just the opposite. It is a seriously inflammatory factor that lowers the level of mutual trust. And I, there are, there are uh, eyewitnesses who, 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 who say today that nobody would take this seriously. Um, um, they answered Putin, oh, yes, but, but Ukraine still should be a member of NATO. So completely, a complete negligence about how a very powerful neighbor uh, sees the world. It doesn't matter. It's, it's, it's about us. We are stronger. We have higher technology. We have, we, we have a much higher level of GDP. Um, and that kind of inner way of thinking uh, is one. I'm not saying that this is the only reason why we are in this world, but it's a very important factor which we have to understand. So in other words, we here in Europe, in Budapest, and Kursak, and Eastern Center, we need more self-reflection. <coughs> when we are thinking about the, the, today's and tomorrow's work. So, um, in 2008, that was already the turning point. Dugin, one of the other philosophers of, um, and, um, and mentor of, 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 of Putin, started his own marches. Um, this this um, illiberal or, or um, nationalistic slogans are well known, as you can see in other parts of the world. Glory to Russia, Russian Russia, uh, <coughs> Uh, and um, all the NGOs are, are agents of, of CIA, etc., etc. So it was already, the situation was, how to say, um, clearly leading to the today's um, war conflict from 2008 on. So in a very, very short period of time, from the fall of Gorbachev till the, 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 rise, the rise of Putin, um, the situation, the expectations, the hopes concerning cooperation between, between uh, previous adversaries changed. Mm -hmm. Is there a way out? Where did we in the Western world? Um, where did we lose our way? Um, we, need, we need, as I said, more self reflection. I have some answers, I don't know more of the answers, so it's just a little food for thought for you. Uh, I hope we will meet and we can discuss this. This is today. Um, this is the middle of the war, April, October. Um, and again, um, there were a lot of warnings before. <clears throat> a very well-known, um, um, still active, um, general who retired as a, as a NATO a leader, but he is very active giving interviews and writing books, wrote a kind of a documentary novel, War with Russia, was translated to Hungarian many languages, in which he described how unprepared the Western world is for a potential war. In a very mocking way, the a NATO, NATO summit somewhere 2016, six years ago. That um, gave it and Germany and France are, are, are discussing the future, and uh, the Putin is getting more um, belligerent. <clears throat> no, no serious change. The British um, um, military equipment was rotten down and uh, sold. Germany is very happy with their, with their um, uh, peace attitude, yeah, and the military attitude that they would never get engaged in war. And then in the corner, at the end, um, the Hungarians and Greek representatives were talking about some 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 corruption business, how to how to deal with certain things, nothing to do with the, the prospects of NATO. Um, there was a, a Norwegian, Norwegian series, TV series. Uh, I, I watched um, most of it. Um, very much reminding on um, scenes and. 56, by the way, I forgot to say today, it's not just a day of celebration today, it's the day when Soviet troops invaded Hungary in 
56 and climb down to the evolution, which has to be remembered too. This series um, has shown um, corruption in, in, in Western Europe, the negligence, the lack of understanding of the seriousness of, of um, security problems, but it also um, has shown Russia as an invader. Russia invading in different ways, they, how they started in Ukraine, you know, hybrid war type, and then more and more invading and then dictating the politics of Norway vis-a-vis -vis the European Union. Now that was taken so seriously by the Russian diplomacy that um, there was a diplomatic scandal and the, 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 the series um, of movies was banned. The disappeared. Um, <clears throat> And now, it seems that there is a, there is a scenario that the war, the war um, is going to go on and on. I hope not, but there is a kind of a, you know, promise that we are going to give weapons to the Western world, <coughs> to, to Ukraine, um, until they win, until they need. Hmm? We can produce enough weapons, we have a higher, higher level of higher level of, of military technology than the Russians, etc., etc. So this is, what is this? War forever? In the previous lecture I gave um, in the summer, <coughs> or already we had the war, uh, I gave the title of my presentation, Afghanistan forever. Remember, this is metaphorically speaking, the, the example of Afghanistan. Ten years, Russian, Soviet, sorry, Soviet occupation which was also an important factor by the Soviet Union collapse, big failure, and then 20 years American occupation. And American, and I took out this, this slicer, this was too, too, too far. But that was again an interesting point, turning point. We have a lot of miscalculations, as I mentioned in, at the beginning. Perceptions, expectations, hopes, but also miscalculations. Both sides. Uh, Russia miscalculated the weakness of the West. Yes, it is weaker than it used to be. Um, it didn't get a lot of things, but they could not calculate reactions against an invasion. Um, <clears throat> um, so the West did react uh, for me to an unprecedentedly strong way. So it seems to me, if I want, if don't want to be cynical, but uh, I have to say that, that no one else managed to, uh, to unite Europeans so well as Putin did. A lot of, a lot of, a lot of um, conferences. I'm Jean Monnet professor. How many times a year we went to Brussels and seminars and mm -mm -mm, uh, about security, that cooperation, nothing really happened. So sometimes it means that a tragedy is needed. Um, a very sharp change to come to wake up players. I'm sorry to say that. I, I'm, I'm not, not glad to, 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 to make this observation. But still, um, there are people, there are players who, who are pushing militarization um, in smaller countries, bigger countries. It looks like Putin also managed to re-militarize Europe. Now, Sweden and Finland wants to be a member of NATO, they completely um, uh, militarized. Um, Hungary and smaller countries are, are uh, pushing the military industry. And um, it looks like when I talk to people who are responsible for these decisions, that they are kind of happy about it. They say that it's good for the economy. Produce tanks and weapons. Now, there is a literature, uh, it's interesting for economists. There's a, a very interesting literature going back to the 60s about the military industrial complex. This is a, a, a phrase came from Eisenhower. President Eisenhower he stepped down from presidency, born America, and wrote a word about the dangers of the military industrial complex, which is a phenomenon when private industry and state government uh, <clears throat> needs for arms are combined in, um, in a very curious way. 
um, that he suggested that it is going to eat up and undermine democracy. Now, we forgot about military industrial complex, it is a glorious 80s, cooperating interests together, no more arms race now. It seems that there is a military industrial complex, both in the West and also in the East. Um, and and yeah, who, 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 again, who, who, who produces? Who benefits from this? The oil producers and weapon industry and weapon trade, oil trade, fuel trade. OPEC, and they, according to um, to the principles of profit making, they are telling you that yes, it's giving us a lot of profit. They're not going to um, they are not going to produce more more oil because then the oil prices are going up. New OPEC, of course. So it's a very complex game with a lot of players. You cannot blame only Russia. You cannot blame only Western Europe which, or, or the Western world because <coughs> we do not serve um, reflecting enough. It's a lot of lot of um, um, components it has. Um, I hope that the numbers of those who believe that the war is, uh, is giving them a lot of uh, profit is going to shrink. Um, now, here the question with, with the idea of Gorbachev, which was very positively taken by Western leaders like Helmut Kohl and, and President Mitterrand and many others. In this very dangerous situation, do you think it's possible to, to even, is, does it make any sense to talk about a common European home? Or we have to build a Europe, which is a fortress Europe, now completely against Russia. That's what many Western politicians suggest, that we need a new European security system which excludes Russia. Very interesting change. German Social Democratic Party's major um, Congress uh, a year ago suggested that European security has to in involve, has to include Russia. There is no security without Russia. A couple of weeks ago they claimed the opposite. But again, this is the binary thinking. Is Russia identical with Putin and the oligarchs and those who, who started the war, or is a more complex entity? I think we need to be not just economists and politicians, politicians but also sociologists. It's much more complex. Um, <coughs> I, will, I have to jump a little because time has passed. Um, but the best of you um, <coughs> about um, how to say it. Um, Circumventing Russia, controlling Russia, is a very restricted one. Just counted um, a couple of days ago, Russia has 20,000 kilometer borders. And maybe the sanctions block a trade and block um, and, and do, do cause harms for Russian economy. And I'm sure, especially in the middle run, maybe not. You don't, don't feel it, probably they don't feel it in the short run. But Russia has a lot of trade possibilities with the other neighboring countries, and it does. Um, <clears throat> buy weapons from Iran, from, from, from um, North Korea, and, and who knows what's happening in the, the Chinese-Russian border. We do not know. So again, we need a larger picture, a more complex picture, um, if, we, if we want to get closer um, to realities. Um, I understand that the Western world doesn't have more um, uh, tools for the time being, um, than, than, than sanctions, um, <clears throat> but um, just believing that the war should continue um, permanently is a very, very dangerous misperception. So again, so my conclusion is that we need to think about compromise, even if there is no solution. Yeah? To suggest that the war should continue until Ukraine wins, I think it's it's. It's very, very, very dangerous. Um, but it's an interesting chart. How complex our world is. Not at all, um, not at all all of the uh, states stopped, stopped um, trading with Russia. Yes, Germany minus the, South Korea minus 17, United States minus 35, Sweden minus 76. United Kingdom almost minus 80, but India plus 310% trade with Russia. 
um, Turkey almost 200 years. So this is not a homogeneous member. Okay? Turkey is a NATO member, a very strong member of the NATO. Plays a very interesting role. So there is the Western world with its bubble around its head, that we are the glorious West still. There is a Russian bubble that suggests that the Western world is collapsing and uh, <clears throat> they're weak and now our time has come. There, are, there, there is a third observers group who try to play the game according to their, their own interest. And if we don't, typical Western European or Hungarian um, approach, we don't deal with that. As if the whole game would be only between Western Europe and Russia. It's not true. <clears throat> of course, we could talk a lot about environment. I don't go into details because, but that's a very interesting, very telling story about the paradoxical or yeah, paradoxical nature of the Western approach. Um, Jose Borrell, Portuguese politician, he's the, the foreign minister of. of um, of the European Union, high representative of the European Union for foreign affairs and security. And he said some couple of months ago, very, very bold and interesting suggestions. And uh, very, just a month ago, October 6th in Prague, he announced the first summit of the European political community. Now I said, wow, now finally, big. Uh, the EU's big, big problem that it did not become a, a, a player on the global scale. It's a, it's a giant in economic sense and it's a dwarf in terms of, of, of political power. It was under the tutelage of the United States and it was a very good position. I was talking about uh, transnational democracy and institutions now. He said, okay, the board provoked out uh, <clears throat> that there will be a and the European political community, why is it important? Because that's a historic um, breakthrough. <clears throat> the promise at the, at the end of the Second World War was that never again war between you know, like the old enemies, France and Germany. So we create institutions which make it impossible to start the war again. But then came the instant enlargement of the 89. And that was not thought over. So one of the big crises uh, causes that that the European integration started without really rethinking the European construction. And those institutions which, which uh, managed to deal with the post for Europe in terms of Western of the EU 6 and the EU 12 were not really functioning in the case of EU 27, 28. And that is the, the crisis of the European Union. And now I thought that well, the war, however terrible it is, at least provoked positively um, the European political thinking. Finally, we are going to have the European political community of 27, or you can see there are perhaps 36 member states. Now, <clears throat> so beautiful words. He said, um, today, 44 European leaders, so the candidates were also invited to this meeting, gather here together in order to study how to build a new security structure in Europe. It has to be done without Russia, not because we do not want Russia to be part of Europe, but because Putin's Russia has taken itself out <coughs> of the European community. So far, so good. But then he made, he made um, a comment. It wasn't really a bad series of this comment. In one of his interviews, he said that besides you don't, you don't have, you, you should not forget that Europe is a garden. We are the garden and the rest the jungle. <laughs> you see, so a guy who steps up in the name of 500 million people, yeah, saying that now we are going to create a, a democratic community, but a defense, sorry, a defense community as well. He says, but you know, you are old. You are all <laughs> in this terrible chaotic world. Be now, I, I, if I had a chance, I would call him or challenge him. Myself, but maybe you want to say that there is a jungle in the garden. The jungle in, in in your way of thinking, the chaos, yeah, in in the in, in the third perception as that that the word has to be still understood according to Eurocentric views. That is the problem. Now here is my my uh, 
should conclude soon, my assumption. I think you can have bubbles around your head. All people have, you know, sometimes 75 or people remember how they look when they were 35, and so they feel inside and out. Young and so I think that's, that's the normal thing, especially in the case of the um, Then it is. Um, political communities. Two, um, in, when you have a peaceful period, um, I was, um, I visited once, um, uh, down, uh, Downing Street, uh, with a foreign, uh, foreign office in, in, in London. And the first uh, thing I saw a huge, a huge, huge painting on the wall. Uh, and that is you walk in a long corridor and you, you, you get closer to Britannica, a beautiful woman in arms, and all the others, poor, uh, dirty um, beggars. <laughs> Like France and Germany, and praying, and all the whole world to to this this strong lady hmm? uh, to help her out. Hmm? So that is the bubble in what was in '97 probably. Uh, the British Empire was far away, but they still had this you know this, this glory. So these bubbles can can be kept uh, in times of peace or or normalcy. But in, in times of war, this bubble flash and they, they explode. And we are in this moment now. And this is the moment of, of self-reflection. And Mr. Borrell vaguely apologized. He was very fiercely criticized. I don't think he really understood that it was a mistake. Now he is a very strong um, um, country, not so strong, a very nice person, I think. Well, of short, he talks about Europe 36. Yeah? Um, and he gives them an, an outline of the future. Um, well, an EU rapid response to him in three years, 2025, uh, not very, very fast, but understandable. It's not so easy to build up a, a new European army. And that is a new doctrine. You never heard this before. Germany is ready for a leading military role to ensure Europe's security. Um, <clears throat> Okay, well, oh, if this is happening or not, I do not know. We don't know. If the war will be finished soon, maybe they will, and everything, they will believe that everything goes back to normalcy. I doubt it. Now, how will the war be ended? I don't know if you have thought about that, uh, but now there are signals that the US Congress, not just the Republicans, are kind of pushing the administration to find um, uh, to find circumstances to start the end game. So now giving permanent weapons to the Ukrainians. But who is going to agree in a ceasefire? Freezing troops in place in the winter. They need to adopt opposing positions, and here comes my assumption uh, about paradoxicality. paradoxicality and the uh, and the, the, and the uh, situation, there's no answer. So there's no, no one solution. Uh, Putin or Russia will never give up. They would they say they have a right of contest, um, but the Western world would never accept it. So who is going to decide? Who is going to? Um, well, it seems that Beijing, China has to play or will play. Uh, what if they have a, a bird view about harmony? You know, eternal peace and, and slow um, development, advancement in economic terms. That's very interesting. And they have the global strategic initiative. The EU started to work on the European strategic architecture, as I mentioned, and there are third players, the BRICS. <clears throat> now, Lula is not suggesting very different things than Bolsonaro did about geopolitics. Brazil and there are other players, Turkey I mentioned. For me, one thing is clear, that, that is already a, a multipolar world. A multipolar world is rising. It's not going to be dominated by the West, US and Europe. But the West is going to play a role. It has to play a role. What kind of role it is going to play is also up to us. If there will be more self-understanding, self-reflection, um, and the responsibility taking from the European side, including 
um, sciences, that would be maybe a more positive uh, game for the future. Russia um, is not the Soviet Union. Russia is not going to collapse because, just because they, they don't have much success in, the, in Ukraine on the front. That's true. <coughs> they lost a lot. That's true. And no command, a lot of corruption, a lot of terrible things. But as, as a country, Russia is not going to collapse. So we have, we, we have to count with Russia as a big empire in the future. Hmm? So it's the, it's the interest of the world to find a deal, even if this deal is not going to be perfect. It will be a compromise, okay? I don't go into this, this is too, too much. It's the next lecture. <coughs> very interesting to see this, very, the, the world the cultural map, how it's changing. Um, <clears throat> uh, United States is moving down towards more, more um, survival interests, survival uh, values. Um, Ukraine has also moved up, more, more secular values. But we don't have now time for this. That's very interesting because we, in political science, in sociology, in economics, we talk about countries, nation states as entities. Meanwhile, these are very contradictory units. Okay? Our world is, is, is growing, increasingly polarized. You can see how, how polarized the United States became, that the yellow one. <coughs> the United States of America since 2000. Um, is the most polarized country of the world. So there is no one American point of view, and there will be always almost 50%, yeah? close to 50%. Now the Congress might be taken back by the Republicans, what's going to happen? You see, but to have a divided world makes this whole picture, um, the global picture, much more complex and complicated, and we need to um, analyze this. As again, um, I'm not going to put there are big differences in, in um, proportions, but even Sweden, in Sweden, the Swedish, uh, the Sweden Democrats um, kind of um, can rule the government. So, understanding complexities and responsibilities, we need, and one of my answers, we had started a little conversation with um, uh, uh, Dean Chichman and Professor Reschnitzer. Professor Friedler before the lecture, we need networking. We need to share our knowledge, but we need new knowledge. But we have to build with a new understanding, more complex understanding of the world. You can't just collect tens for about GDP increasing or decreasing. It doesn't, you know, you can have a lot of facts about the water, then you I have a lot of, I have a lot of data, so what? In Hungary, everyone has a lot of data. Nobody really gives some, some deep, complex analysis. Um, <clears throat> we are recently in a strong cooperation with UNESCO chairs. There was, uh, we have a UNESCO chair in Kyrgyzstan for 11 years. Not much was done. And suddenly we got an invitation to Udina, which is my last point. A University of Udina together with the region of uh, Friuli, uh, Venice, and supported financially by the Central European Initiative, whose headquarters is in Fiesta, <coughs> organized a meeting for like 30 experts from 10 universities in countries, Italy plus Eastern Central Europe. And the first time I saw so many um, responsible friends from neighboring countries. And the task was to create um, a new understanding of our of our academic um, obligations. So we put together a chart, the Udina chart, and a new platform. This is called the platform of uh, Resili Enhanced. It's a game with the word Resilience Enhanced. Uh, <coughs> this platform is available. And the suggestion, most of the participants were very interesting um, engineers. Um, water engineers or, or people who are dealing with, um, with the soil or with volcanoes um, about catastrophes. But they also understand that scientists have to cooperate if we want to become resilient. We have to inform um, decision makers, policy makers, and governments. Governments, local, national, global, European. And that is, for me, a, a good positive signal 
of a new awareness. And that also shows in which direction I think we should go. In June, I congratulate to the university. Um, um, the very fast um, growth, I think, the, that wonderful development. It should be, it is already a, a decisive player uh, in, in Central European um, um, academic uh, games. But that is true that it has to show itself more. I don't go <coughs> into details because um, these are um, our research projects which we have time to discuss this um, the next time. This is something that we just um, finishing together with the Station University and um, I'm very proud that our, our, our conception about creative cities and, and sustainable regions are, are spreading in Europe. We have, um, uh, we have um, a project with eight European Union countries. It means that, and this is my final word, that change has to come from Europe. If there is no solid base, then, then whatever comes from above, it's not going to be lasting. So if local communities, municipalities, universities and cities are working together, um, understanding their, their, their duties and responsibilities, they can create a good base for a sustainable society. Otherwise, we will be just um, imposed and superimposed and exposed to um, dramatic changes coming from above. Um, yeah, and we should think in a larger terms of the macro region, um, as um, was mentioned in the introductions. Um, these are charts which we probably can study later um, and are not so modest. Um, effort in, in, in Kirsten that we are trying to create an international synergy campus where not only very high level elite researchers meet but also a kind of citizen science that, that humankind needs, um, a kind of um, interface with um, civil society and arts, music, etc. is also available, the new version, the new idea of what the university should be. This orphanage is going to be reconstructed. See here the architectural plans. And it has a garden <laughs> with a lot of potential. So you are all kindly invited to participate in this experimentation. We need, we need gardeners, we need people for tourism, we need economists, we need engineers, etc., etc. It's under construction, and, but it will be finished in about two years. So you are most welcome. Uh, this great acceleration of change and a good luck for Sichuan University.